I'm Dr. Lakeisha Roney, and I am joined by James Harris, resident in counseling. A little bit about myself. I'm a mother, daughter, sister, and friend and mentor. I'm also a business owner. I'm owner of Inner Self Counseling and Consultation, LLC, and I'm also executive clinical director at Hype Counseling Services. I also provide clinical supervision at Health Brigade, formerly Fan Free Clinic. I'm a graduate of Virginia State University with a bachelor's degree in psychology and a master's in counseling. I also have a doctoral degree in um, counseling psychology with a concentration in counseling education and supervision. I've been a licensed professional counselor in Virginia since 2005. Um, currently, I serve as VCA chapter chair and I uh, am the RACA, which is Richmond Area Council Association past president. James, would you introduce yourself? How you guys doing? I'm James Harris. I'm from Richmond, Virginia. I'm a father. I'm an entrepreneur. I'm a veteran. I'm the founder of a movement called Men to Heal, which focuses on men's overall wellness, their mental health, as well as their physical health. I'm currently the author of Man Just Express Yourself, which is an interactive planner guide for boys and young men to better express themselves. You can find it on Amazon, Barnes & Nobles, Target, Walmart, and of course, my website, mentoheal.com. I graduated from South University with a bachelor's in clinical, well, clinical psychology, and I have a master's in clinical mental health counseling. I'm a resident in counseling uh, for my LPC, and I will be taking my test at the top of the year once I complete my hours. I'm currently working in private practice as well as community-based services, and I'm taking supervision from Dr. Roney. So our session learner objectives include identifying why gender is a crucial, critical determinant on mental health and mental illness, um, understanding cultural reasons with boys and men of color, acknowledging and coping with mental health concerns, identifying applicable theoretical approaches and techniques to use with boys and men of color, and learn or enhance learning of best practices and ethical standards when working with boys and men of color. Um, same with the overview, um, learning the differences in boys and men of color, seeking services, understanding why gender is a critical determinant on mental health, explore cultural challenges, acknowledging mental health, examining theories and techniques that could address other underlying issues, and review best practices to enhance the counselor's toolbox. So why is it important to focus on male gender identity? Um, so when we speak of men um, and multiculturalism, we oftentimes think of female or other gender identities, but male is considered um, the standard due to us living in a patriarchal society. So seldom is there a, only a focus on men and boys. Um, why is it important to focus on people on color? Um, people of color, there's so many who fall within this category and their experiences are not monolithic. So it's important that we take an individualized approach to counseling them. Boys of color, specifically, it's important to talk about boys of color because they may present very differently uh, when they're in trouble. Um, they may not fit the traditional DSM-5 definition of specific diagnosis and they may present differently um, so we must be aware of the differences, how to treat them differently, and then also um, the cultural academic concerns that they may have that's different than the dominant group. Um, and then with men of color, there's so many factors that impact them that we must um, increase our awareness, that we deepen our empathy and increase our advocacy efforts for men of color because they deal with specific issues that the dominant group just doesn't deal with. So according to the American Counselors Association, a counselor's guide to working with men, um, there's a paradigm shift that has occurred. Due to part, um, men are becoming more active fathers. They're becoming more engaged in their children's lives. But traditionally, men have not always been perceived as human due to the focus on their human and their biological presentation as male, their physical components. Um, and how well they conform to masculine norms and standards. So men are only experiencing, only experiencing men as human being in selective situations. And because of this, um, 
men are only subscribing to sexist stereotypical um, roles. And unfortunately, this is not allowing men to be their whole full selves. So the majority of men have been narrowly defined um, by sexist stereotype. This destroys the very essence of the male soul. And this does not allow them to be their full selves physically, emotionally, mentally, or spiritually. Counseling men, evidence-based counseling interventions with men remain in its early stages of development due to the lack of research and case studies on counseling men. This lack of research has hindered our accurate understandings of men's mental health. So it's important that we expand our knowledge base and working specifically with men. Male and male gender roles and patriarchal structures. So exploring patriarchal structures may be unsettling in counseling men, but that's something that we have to do as counselors sometimes. Um, we have to acknowledge vulnerabilities and insecurities that exist when studying men. And we also must challenge ideas that are outdated, stereotypical, and restrictive gender roles because they do not provide a foundation of equality between the sexes. And social injustice occurs because of sexism and other forms of oppression. And this may be difficult to deal with during sessions. Working with men and abandoning restrictive stereotypes, um, sometimes there's a struggle that occurs when new concepts of gender roles um, that are more healthy and equitable are presented in sessions. And there's no co coherent multicultural approach to understanding men's diversity in the field of counseling. And even less has been written on how the diversity aspects, including race, class, ethnicity, nationality, age, religion, and sexual orientation affect male socialization. And then when it comes to political, eth ethnic, religious values of diverse men around the world, even less research has been conducted. So there are four concepts that expand the theoretical base when working with men. There needs to be a redefinition of male privilege from what we know of in our society. Men providing, proving their masculinity and developing compassion for sexist men. Um, there's a lot of men um, that have uh, perpetuated um, the machismo effect and trying to prove their masculinity. Um, and sometimes um, when working with men, um, they have to develop a deeper compassion for other men who are displaying these types of behavior. And when they develop more compassion for each other, um, there's more understanding between them. There's also a denial about boys and men's problems. And sometimes there's rationalization for certain types of behavior. So those are the types of issues that we have to address in counseling and accepting and using research evidence base when um, counseling men. Uh, we oftentimes will have to rely on research or providing education to men um, to get them to understand that this information um, that we're providing to them, it is backed by research. And sometimes by providing that education, they have a deeper understanding of what's going on. The American Psychological Association provides guidelines for psychological practice with boys and men. So like I mentioned before, boys and men are very diverse. So it's important for us to respect their race, ethnicity, culture, migration status, age, socioeconomic status, ability status, sexual orientation, gender identity, and religious affiliation. Um, the experience of boys and men is not, not, not monolithic. So we must take all of these things into consideration. Each of these social identities contributes unequally and intersexual, intersecting ways to shape how men experience and perform their masculinities, which in turn contribute to relational, psychological, behavioral health outcomes in both positive and negative ways. So these are top, um, the 10 guidelines that the APA provides to um, providers, counselors, whoever is working with men and boys. So these are aspirational um, aspects to strive towards. So strive to recognize that masculinities are constructed based on social, cultural, and contextual norms. Recognize that boys and men 
integrate multiple aspects to their social identities across the lifespan. So it's not something that's just developed in their early childhood. This is developing throughout their lifetime. Understand the impact of power, privilege, and sexism on the development of boys and men on their relationships with others. Develop a comprehensive understanding of factors that influence the interpersonal relationships of boys and men. Strive to encourage positive father male figure involvement in healthy family relationships. And also romantic relationships should be included. Strive to support educational efforts that are responsive to the needs of boys and men. Reduce the high rates of problems boys and men face and act out in their lives, such as aggression, violence, substance use, and suicide. A lot of times those things are attached, especially to toxic mas masculinity. Strive to help boys and men engage in health-related behaviors. Strive to build and promote gender-sensitive psychological services. Understand and strive to change institutional cultural and systemic problems that affect boys and men through advocacy, prevention, and education. And to me, that is the cornerstone of what we can do as counselors to really help boys and men, really changing the systemic problems and really advocate for their well-being. I did include the poem um, by the late, great Paul Lawrence Dunbar, we wear the mask, specifically black Americans put on masks. Um, others use them to ignore the problems that exist in modern society. There's a very deep meaning behind Paul Lawrence Dunbar's writings. Um, they have a deep impact on our understanding of ourselves and others and sarcastically ask why humankind should put out the effort to see behind the mask. But it's also clear that the world does not seem to be willing to do so. So there are times in which black people in particular feel ignored and they feel that they have to put up a facade in order to survive in our society. So be, through the poem um, written by Paul Lawrence Dunbar, we're able to have a deeper understanding of the black experience within American culture. The history of black racial identity. Derecanation, which is an attempt of white slave owners to erase blackness. So when Africans were brought to America during chattel slavery, there was an attempt to erase the blackness, the assertiveness, the aggressiveness. And slave owners would beat slaves into submission and the slave would learn how to be a slave, to be submissive. And they would no longer be black, alone, no longer be African. And this was a decreased awareness of issues pertaining to race and class. It, utilized, it was utilized to increase acceptance into mainstream society and decrease with the probability of group mobilization. Nigger sense is the development of the black identity. So nigger sense came out of the French word to mean um, to be black. And um, during the time when this theory was being developed, um, they identified what you would call traditional Negroes like Booker T. Washington, but then also identified agitators and black militants such as W.E.B. Du Bois or the Black Panthers um, as individuals that went to the other end of the extreme of embracing their black identity. Malcolm X or Frederick Douglass would also be included in that group. In the 1970s, there was the emphasis shift to describing a developmental process of developing um, identity. We have the Cross, Faith and Smith's model of black identity development. So in 1971, Cross adopted the idea of Nickerson's the process of becoming black is the foundation for the later sector model develops the Fagan Smith. The model looks at the progression of the identification of individuals as they move towards a healthy black identity. So like I mentioned, the black experience is not monolithic. Black identity develops differently for everyone. Some black identity didn't start early in childhood and it was early adult 
experiences that shape their identity. Others are the void of Black identity due to where and how they were raised and sometimes due to issues of self-hatred. So as we can see, stage one is pre-encounter. A person identifies with white people and culture and rejects or devalues black people and culture. Stage two is encounter, characterized by emotional and personal experience, which fosters a need for change. Stage three is immersion, immersion, personal completely identifies with blacks, idealizes black cultures and a barbers, all things white. And stages four, internalization, a person overcomes defensiveness, idealization, and psychological effects of racism and develops a positive and secure black identity. And then that leads us to stage five, commitment. A person maintains black identity while resisting various forms of social oppression. We also have racial and cultural identity development model developed by Sue and Sue. Um, the same type of stage development, but this can be um, applied to all minority groups, such as the cross model, cross, cross model uh, specifically focus on black people, but the Sue and Sue model can be applied to other minorities in general. And their model um, focus on stage one in conformity, where there is a preference for the dominant cultural values. And it moves all the way through the stages to stage five, which is the integrative awareness, where there is a belief that there are acceptable and unacceptable aspects of all cultures, but the person should determine for themselves what is desirable for them. The out of the progressing through this developmental model is to reach that integrative awareness. Now there is, um, there are other white racial identity development models and they typically take on the opposite stages of development. And one in particular that I'm thinking about is Helms, white racial identity development. Um, so with the white racial identity development, their stage one starts off as contact, where the individual is oblivious to racism and had little contact with black people or other minorities and proclaims to be colorblind. But as they move and progress through the stages of development, they wind up at stage five, which is autonomy, where the individual is aware of their own whiteness and understands how they can contribute to weight. Um, to awareness, they, they, they actually move towards more awareness as opposed to the other ethnic um, identity developmental models. So there are several recommended theoretical approaches to use with boys and men of color um, that I've identified. Um, black psychology, multicultural counseling and therapy, functional psychology and human existential therapy, and also um, feminist theory. Black psychology was developed out of uh, the notion that the black experience is different from the dominant group experience. Counselors must explore the entire history of the client and have an understanding of the historical context of their experience. And there are a lot of black psychologists as well as counselors that argue that the European model of psychology is not adaptable to black behavior, personality, or mental functions. Black psychologists consider worldviews, social reality as a way of explaining disparities among black ethnicities. And overall, there are three different types of black psychology. We have the traditional type. It's an application of European norms in analyzing black behavior. We have the reformist, which is an adaptation of conventional thought and to conform to the black experience with very little regard to African foundations. And then we have the radical black psychology that has an African ethos as a way to analyze black behavior independent of European theory. And those foundational aspects include religion, philosophy, spirituality, ritualism, concept of time, and worldview. 
Social realities of Black boys are very different than their counterparts. Black boys oftentimes experience um, things such as academic inferiority in schools. Sometimes they're overly diagnosed. Sometimes they're not uh, provided with appropriate accommodations to meet their needs. So within Black psychology, there's an um, underpinning un understanding of these social factors that occur with Black men and boys. Um, here is a, the economist worldview of African worldview versus European worldview. Um, there is definitely a difference in how each worldview views nature, person, relationships, religion, transformation. Um, so in understanding these different types of worldview, you also have to reflect upon the fact that um, Africans that were brought here to the Americas during chattel slavery came out of this worldview, um, especially of nature, seeking harmony and new in, in unity within nature and being implanted into the Americas where the view of nature is dominance and control. It's very different than their original worldview and how a lot of people from that are African descent still hold on to this worldview. So it's in direct conflict with how our society is built. Some of the key words and themes include rhythm, oral tradition, soul, extended self, natural survival of the group. The next approach is multicultural counseling and therapy. All helping methods exist within a cultural context. So within multicultural counseling, everything exists within a cultural context. Um, the concept is that all of us are cultural beings. Acknowledges that there are differences among and within clients. Um, examines how family and cultural factors affect individual worldviews. Recognizes cultures as internalized experience, subjective perspective formed against a backdrop of contrasting cultural backgrounds. The importance of seeing individual context is the focus and cultural internet, internationality is the main focus. Traditional theories are justice to show respect for human diversity. So in saying that the multi, multicultural counseling is viewed as the fourth force in counseling. And this was coined by Penderson in 1999, multicultural as the full force in counseling, and it signifies a change in the works of our profession. And we can see that um, based on our codes of ethics, our cultural competency um, models, um, in our, how the, the theory is impacting um, how we practice as counseling as a whole. And cultural competency has impacted in, in social justice that we're providing as counselors. So multicultural competency is definitely um, that forced force. And there was an attempt to establish multicultural counseling and therapy as a valuable theoretical perspective. Um, but there were so many different perspectives within this theory. So there is no comprehensive theory per se, but there are many different perspectives. The key concepts for multicultural com competency in counseling um, include cultural, cultural expectation, awareness, cultural identity, um, of cultural identity development, internalization, community, family, self-concept, ethnic heritage, traditional healing, liberation of consciousness, multicultural respect, worldview. Functional psychology is an understanding of psychological process by the casual relations to one another to, and to sensory inputs and behavioral outputs. The focus was to understand the function of the mind the function was to aid the organism in adapting to its environment. So it's a very practical type of psychology and desire to be practiced, a practical science and findings to be an improvement of the human condition. They're concerned with the why of the mental process and this led directly to an interest in motivation 
It's accept both mental process and behavior and both are accepted as legitimate psychology. It's interested in individual differences and more interested in the individual differences among organisms than similarities. So in functional psychology, they, function, they really focus on, does this plan work for the client? And then the client creates that plan. If it works for the client, then it works. Francis Summer, Sumner and Kenneth Clark. Okay, so when we talk about some of the history in functional psychology, I think it's important to, to point out some of the, the leaders. Francis Sumner was the first African-American psychologist and taught at Howard University. And he supervised and taught Kenneth Clark. Well, Kenneth and Mamie Clark were both researchers and psychologists known for their work that was done in the 1940s using dolls to assess children's racial attitudes. So if you've heard of the black doll experiment, they were the experimenters, they were the researchers of those studies. The work that they did contributed to the Supreme Court ruling in Brown versus the Board of Education um, that ended racial segregation in public education. Functional psychology, central ideas stream of consciousness, study of the self, habits, theory of emotion, specu speculations, pragmatism. Humanistic existential psychology. Humanism views the individuals as essentially good and growth oriented. If people depart from the basic nature, they may commit bad or destructive acts. If a relationship is characterized by acceptance, caring, trust, respect, a person can gain his or her emotional and spiritual equilibrium. Um, something that I did not include that I think is very important because humanistic existential psychology is my secondary theory that I use in counseling is um, finding meaning and struggle. And I think that is very important to um, clients that are um, of color because if they've gone through some type of struggle, being able to focus on that and make meaning and purpose out of those um, difficult situations, I think enhances their treatment. It deals with the dynamic over ever-changing transitions that individuals encounter as they emerge, evolve, and become. It assists clients in answering questions like, who will I be? Who am I? Where do I come from? The core of existentialism connection is the I thou relationship, and the therapist is merely a guide to the counselee's journey of self discovery. So, humanistic existential has always been looked upon as multicultural because it's been noted as one of the ethno culturally sensitive approaches because it's emphasis on individuals' experience and the process of self discovery. It has the potential to be sensitive to the needs of different cultures and gender identities and expressions because it deals with the individual of where he, she, they are. And it also celebrates the individual uniqueness. Um, I thought it was interesting that I read a, a study that focused on exis humanistic existentialism impact on social justice. So there are some foundational commitments to human dignity, empathy, and compassion that can and should make important contributions to understanding social justice issues and the protest movement because there are threats to oneself or existence or being cut off to sources of meanings or relationships or limiting or imposing one's political freedom, which is necessary implications for one's existential freedom. So with all this uh, with all the racial unrest that we've been dealing with and um, issues of COVID, I think humanistic existentialism um, as a valuable theory in working with clients that are um, being impacted by all that's going on in society um, could be applicable during this time. Central ideas include being in the world, four ways of being, time and being, anxiety, living and dying, freedom, responsibility and choice, isolation and loving, meaning and meaninglessness, and striving for authenticity. And the last theory I wanna talk about is feminist theory. Um, the client knows best for their life. 
and is the expert on their own life. The emphasis on educating clients about the therapy process. Traditional ways of assessing psychological health are challenged and assume that the individual change will best occur through social change. Um, They're encouraged to take social action. Um, Personal is political. Um, Personal and social identities are interdependent. And the counseling relationship is egalitarian. Uh, Women's experiences are honored and the definitions of distress and mental illness are reformed and rejected by the traditional disease model. So that um, heavy reliance on the DSM is not there. Um, And there's a more integrated analysis of oppression, which emphasizes the importance of working against oppression based on race, class, culture, religious beliefs, sexual orientation, age, and disability. Um, I thought it was important to note um, when working with uh, minority clients, especially black clients, it might be important for um, counselors to interject or or incorporate um, some of the black feminist movement um, ideas, um, especially from R.J. Lord or Bell Hooks, because a lot of their centralized focus was uh, racial injustice and black identity. The key theory concepts, um, feminist theory, key concepts include view of human nature, feminist perspectives on personality um, development, principles of feminist theory. Um, Some goals of therapy include empowerment, um, going for change, social change, value and diversity, um, keeping independence and being um, interdependent separated. And some techniques include race, culture, and gender influences on symptoms, not heavily relying on the DSM, and therapists not using specific techniques, but being more client-centered techniques, depending on the individual's needs. And my last slide includes some best practices offered by the American Psychiatric Association when working with other individuals of color. I thought that would be helpful Um, Some of the commonalities um, between the individuals are using the biopsychosocial cultural model in evaluating and treating individual, um, using collaborative care um, for individuals, um, allowing sufficient time for your interviews because there may be some language barriers or if the individual has an interpreter, Um, the use of cognitive behavioral therapy, a lot of times with um, people of color, they respond better to um, more cognitive styles of treatment in the more direct type of treatment. Um, be, being aware of how the environment is set up, making sure that is inviting and warm, that makes a lot of difference to people of color. And avoiding stereotypes and misjudgment. And then the advocacy piece is very important. Making sure that we advocate for people that are in need or um, uh, that are oppressed or or dealing with issues um, from systemic racism. James? So applications, theories, and a case study that I put together. So my approach is definitely um, humanistic as existential, but also reality therapy, choice therapy, um, and of course, uh, CBT cognitive behavior therapy. This tends to work better with uh, African-American men, boys. All right, so what is it to get started? Reality therapy is a form of counseling that views the behaviors as choices. Um, and, you know, it states that our symptoms occur because of, not because of mental illness, but due to people irresponsibility, uh, choosing behaviors to fulfill their needs. Reality therapy's goal is to help people accept responsibility for their behaviors and choose more desirable actions. This was founded uh, in 1965 by, of course, Mr. Do- Dr. William Glasser. So how to use reality therapy or choice therapy? So humans have five basic uh, genetical uh, needs within our genetic instructions. We got survival, loving and belonging, power or achievement, freedom, or independence, fun, and enjoyment. Uh, The key concepts definitely include behavior, control, responsibility, action, present movement. So when it comes to behavior, that's pretty much our central 
component of reactive therapy. They categorize into organized behavior and recognize our behaviors. Control is the choice theory suggests that persons, that people are controlled by themselves. It states that the idea of being controlled by external factors is ineffective for making change. When it comes to responsibility, control is wisely linked to responsibility. Like what are we responsible for? Um, actions, according to reality therapists, your actions are a part of your overall behavior. It also maintains that you have control over your actions. Uh, within the present moment, of course, we want to stay in the here and now approach to better uh, gain a grasp of our current responsibilities. Reality therapy techniques. So one of the most important techniques is, of course, self-evaluation. The therapist will use this technique to help recognize your actions that are current. <clears throat> this serves as a foundation to plan new actions, like we can, you know, uh, remove those maladaptive behaviors. They might ask you questions like, uh, what are your perceptions of goals you're trying to achieve? Uh, how do you plan to achieve them? What, you know, are your current goals realistic? How are you willing to make change within yourself and your environment? Um, as far as the action plan, you definitely want to, again, make sure that you're doing self-evaluations. We guide you through action planning. This is a task that we do together. Uh, the goal of this plan is to, again, create new actions that better serve your needs. Generally, these actions are, you know, we want to make sure that they're simple, uh, specific to your current needs and your goals. They're measurable, they're obtainable, and they focus on the result rather than the action uh, to be avoided. They, we want them to be immediate or set some type of time limited function to where that you can better achieve them. Uh, when it comes to reframing, this is something that's definitely important because you want to express the concept in a positive way or less negative way so your clients can interpret and feel better about themselves. This can help shift our mindset from problem focused to solution focused. Behavior rehearsal. Behavior rehearsal involves practicing appropriate behaviors. For example, uh, you as a therapist might have, you know, imagine or talk about these behaviors in a different way, or you might take action out to of a situation with your therapist. So you guys can rehearse different things um, so they can have insight on how to do these things without you being involved, such as at work, school, or the home environment. CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, is pretty much one of the <clears throat> um, strong foundation which works amazing with African-American men and boys as well. Um, it definitely helps you become aware of your inaccurate or negative thinking so that you can view your challenges situations more clearly, respond to them in a more effective way. Cognitive behavior therapy uh, can be done one-on-one -on -one or in a group setting with family members or other people who have similar issues. And we, when we talk about similar issues, we can look now at, of course, of COVID or the unjust killings of African-American men that's constantly been viewed and displayed in the news. Those things are traumatic. Um, so a group setting to process this might work better for some men um, because it's like their shared experience or of course they can do the individual setting as well. During CBT, your therapist will encourage you to talk about your thoughts, your feelings, and what's troubling you so we can better assist you. Um, CBT generally focuses on the problem using goal-oriented approach. <clears throat> so when you're talking about the actions for CBT, you wanna identify the troubling situation or conditions in your life. You and your therapist may spend time deciding what the problem is so we can focus on that. We can get right to it. Um, want to assist you in becoming aware of your thoughts, your emotions, your belief about these problems. Um, you also want to remember that the problem is the problem. You're not the problem. Once you've identified the problem, it's easier for you to be able to work on it. So you, uh, the therapist will encourage you to share your thoughts about them, assist you in uh, positive self-talk, of course. Um, identify negative or inaccurate thinking to help you recognize the patterns of your thinking and change your behaviors to contribute that contribute to your problem. <clears throat> you may pay attention to, of course, your physical, your emotional, your behavior responses in different situations. So when I'm in session with somebody, I'm analyzing everything, their body language, um, if their leg is shaking, if their eyes are twitching, their hands, you know, different things like that. Uh, reshape the negative or inaccurate thinking, your therapist will likely encourage you to ask yourself whether you view the situation as based on fact or inaccurate perception of what's actually going on. You know, these steps can be difficult, of course, so we want to make sure that 
you're thinking about life and yourself in a practical way. So a case study um, that I'm going to show you guys using CBT and reality choice therapy um, is definitely one that's beneficial. So we want to ensure that the fulfillment of an individual needs in the present, regardless of what traumas he may be facing or suffered in the past, it's all that matters. <clears throat> in other words, your thoughts, the power of free will, have the capacity to modify our behaviors. So in this case study, we're going to look at Tim J, who is a 15-year-old male. Tim self-identifies as Black and gay. Tim's presenting problem is fear that his, he is going to become angry when he finds out, his father will become angry when he finds out that he's gay. Uh, Tim is requesting help in changing his behaviors so that his father will not become angered. He has been avoiding his father on a weekly basis. In most households, uh, being gay is still taboo, especially for Black men who you know, are those overbearing fathers who want their children, specifically boys, to live vicariously through them. So the father demands that Tim plays masculine sports, uh, work with his hands, but of course, Tim wants to work on computers and be a baker. Tim has thoughts of self-harming and he becomes depressed when he feels alone um, and he's often sad. So as far as this orientation, how I implement um, CBT as well as reality therapy, it is imperative that I create a strong therapeutic alliance between Tim and myself. I have to address certain differences as far as our age issues and the views of society based on masculinity, which is in, in part of uh, what his father is actually dealing with, the masculinity factor and, and the age difference between he and his father and how his father was raised. Reality therapy requires a goal to come that the client um, and the therapist work, you know, in tandem. We create this thing together. I will not analyze his needs and the degree level of his different needs. So we'll break it down to identify what's more beneficial to him at this current time. Uh, the goal will be to teach Tim how to make better decisions that will help him get more of what he wants to reduce his depression and, of course, not to avoid his father. Uh, we'll work with him from the assumption that Tim wants more satisfying relationship with his father. I will listen to Tim describe his feelings of depression, anger, and of course, anxiety. I'll display empathy and I would uh, assist Tim to stop dwelling in the past and move forward to create a better, better future. Um, as we continue, I will, of course, ask Tim, how would your life be different if your father accepted your choice? You know, and it'll be more questions surrounding this topic or his view um, on how his life will be different. Um, I would suggest role playing, of course. That's a, definitely a benefit to him. Perhaps bringing his father in a few sessions after Tim and I, of course, establish rapport and build our cohesive unit. So down the line, we can introduce father. Um, I would have them to role play with each other or have Tim rehearse in a mir mirror like we spoke of earlier. So this way he can practice his communication. Um, normally, pretty much that's reserved for himself and his father. I would explain that he has the picture in his head of his ideal life, but he does not possess those behaviors to get, the, get him there. So I'll assist with all that. Um, so the next step, of course, would definitely be creating more sessions that will focus on him to implement his change and take an action to get closer to his ideal life. He will also learn to self-evaluate his behaviors and his goals um, and not rely on the counselor. Like we want to assist them in uh, living day to day without us, like planning for discharge immediately, making sure that they are growing to use these tools outside of therapy. Uh, Tim will be assigned, of course, journaling homework, um, and I'll ask him to write a letter for it, a letter to his father. Now, whether he read that letter or give it to his father or not, that's something different. We can explore that in another session. But the idea of this uh, goal is to help him get his thoughts out of his head onto something tangible that he can see and work towards. Tim will also be introduced, of course, to relaxation techniques to decrease depression. And uh, he'll focus on deep breathing. So role play is another fundamental exercise that, that can be used on CBT. Role play can definitely assist with working through different behaviors, but difficult situations, plan out possible scenarios to lessen the fear of when he do actually speak to his father. So Tim and I will role play. Again, I will encourage him to role play with himself in the mirror, such as a rehearsal. But this right here will improve a problem solving uh, skill 
and end those thoughts of self-harm, gaining familiar, familiarity and confidence in certain situations. It was system and practice in his social skills, assertiveness training and time to take a step to inform his father of his sexual preference and his gender identity. Uh, and it would also assist him improving the communication skills with his father in the aspects of their relationship. So here are our references. And thank you for attending our presentation and we will conclude with questions and discussion.